Okay, hello, and welcome to the first session of the day. Um, I am very excited to introduce our first invited speaker of the day, um, Cynthia Dwork. Cynthia is a distinguished scientist at Microsoft Research. She is probably best known in this community for um, starting this whole area of research on differential privacy, but in the past she's also made huge contributions in cryptography and distributed computing, and in fact was awarded the Dijkstra Prize for her work on consensus in distributed computing. Um, she has a whole list of honors. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Engineering. Um, she's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And today she's going to be talking to us about um, privacy in the land of plenty. So let's welcome Cynthia. Good morning. Thanks very much for that introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Okay, so I'm going to need two people in this talk, so let me introduce you to Helen Nissenbaum. My interest in privacy arose in conversations with Nissenbaum, who's a philosopher who studies philosophical issues that arise in the context of new technologies. For simplicity, in this talk, we're going to focus on a scenario in which one or more data analysts interacts with a database. So we're going to assume that the database is filled with very useful but possibly sensitive information belonging to many individuals drawn from a population, and our goal is to learn about the underlying population while not compromising the privacy of the individuals in the data set. The census was a motivating example since privacy of census data is legally mandated, but there are zillions of applications from the allocation of resources to early detection of epidemics based on over-the-counter um, drug purchases to analyzing loan data for systematic evidence, I mean evidence of systematic discrimination and so on. I am not going to be talking today about so-called de-identification or anonymization. So this is some mythical process in which an original database is quote unquote sanitized by an intermediary who releases a de-identified data set after which the original database and the intermediary go away. And uh, a whole host of results teach us that de-identified data isn't. Either it is no longer meaningful data or it is not properly de-identified. So we are not going to be talking about that today. So what if the analyst is restricted to quote unquote just asking statistical queries, assuming we actually had a definition of what is a statistical query? So uh, for example, she may only be running learning algorithms or asking for means of random variables or things like that. And that doesn't sound too compromising. But I call this the statistics masquerade. So uh, consider the very simple differencing attack. The first question is how many members of the House of Representatives have the sickle cell trait? So let's assume that the House of Representatives is a very large set. Somehow the intuition is that the answer to that question doesn't leak information about any individual. But if you pair it with another question over another large set, in this case asking how many members of the House other than the Speaker of the House have the sickle cell trait. Clearly, if you have the exact answer to both of these questions, you can take the difference and figure out the status of the Speaker. Now, that's just a special example of a much more general sort of attack um, uh, initiated by Dinora Nisim. And the Dinora Nisim attack and the many variants that followed uh, can be sort of summarized by what I call the fundamental law of information recovery, which says that overly accurate answers to too many statistics completely de destroys privacy. And to quote one paper, these results show that existing designs for query systems do not adequately prevent disclosure of confidential data by combinatorial inference. 
This observation is not new. However, it has only been recently that we have begun to understand the myriad of inference techniques that may be used. We are continually finding that compromise is easier than once thought. Does anyone want to guess when this was written? 1980. So this problem has been studied for a very long time, since at least the 70s. And um, it's only getting worse. And it's getting worse because in modern times, the confidential database is no longer in vitro. It's in vivo. It's being used to generate publicly observable actions. It can be cross-linked with other data sets that are available on the web. And so now things are just that much worse. Information flows and combines in many different ways. And uh, privacy protection becomes much, much harder. So Latanya Sweeney said, computer science got us into this mess. Can computer science get us out of it? And that's what we're going to do. Now, definitions are essential. Without them, we literally do not know what we are talking about, which is very bad on an internet scale. So let's start with what do we mean by privacy-preserving data analysis? What kind of protection should we be offering Helen? Now, a natural candidate, and certainly the one that I first tried, closely echoes the Goldwasser and Mikali 1982 definition of semantic security for a crypto system, and actually was articulated by the statistician Tor Delanius in 1977, so five years before Goldwasser and Mikali. And it says that the data analyst shouldn't learn anything new about Helen. That is, data analysts may already know a lot about Helen, or there may be a lot of information about her that's available from other sources, and on her website, and in her publications, and so on. And what we want is that by interacting with this confidential database, the data analysts shouldn't learn new things not previously known about Helen. So my feeling there is, if I can't learn anything new about Helen, what is the point? For example, suppose I'm from Mars, and I believe that all humans have two left feet. And I interact with the statistical database, and I learn that the overwhelming majority of humans has one left foot and one right foot. So before I interacted with the database, I thought Helen had two left feet. Now that I've interacted with the database, I've learned something new about Helen. I've learned that in all likelihood, she has one left and one right foot. Was Helen's privacy compromised here? My intuition is no. And in fact, if Helen had been replaced in the database with another random member of the population, I would have learned exactly the same things. So ideally, our notion of privacy is going to be that we learn the same things if Helen is replaced by another random member of the population. And you guys have a term for this. It's some sort of stability, right? It says the same things are learned even if the database is perturbed slightly. So that's pretty much what differential privacy says. We'll get to the mathematical definition in a moment. It says that the outcome of any analysis is essentially equally likely, and I will say exactly what that means and exactly what the probability space is, independent of whether any individual joins or refrains from joining the data set. The same things are going to be learned about me whether I join or I don't join. That feels to me like a very strong notion of privacy. So, same things are learned if Helen goes away, if LaTanya joins, if Helen is replaced by LaTanya, and so on. So that's our notion of privacy. But remember, we're interested in privacy-preserving data analysis. And everybody always talks about the tension between privacy and utility. But stability, which is the core of our definition of privacy, is also crucial to preventing overfitting and permitting generalizability. So 
privacy and generalization are actually aligned. So this is the definition of differential privacy. Um, the version of this definition uh, that first appeared with McSherry, Nisim, and Smith had delta equal to zero. Delta was introduced a little bit later, a couple months later. So a mechanism, so what we, we call our algorithms mechanisms. These are things that operate on data sets and produce outputs. So a mechanism is said to give epsilon delta differential privacy if for all pairs of data sets D and D prime that differ in one element. What we mean here is that they differ in that one of them has the data of just one more person, okay? Because we wanted a definition of privacy that says the same things are learned independent of whether in any individual joins or refrains from joining. So you could imagine, for example, that D prime is the database without my data and D is the same database but just with my data added. So for all pairs of data sets D and D prime that differ in just one element, and every possible event, that is every subset of possible outputs from our algorithm, the probability of observing that event is essentially the same in these two adjacent data sets. So the probability of observing the event under D, let's say, is at most e to the epsilon, which is approximately one plus epsilon when epsilon is small, times the probability of observing it when the database is D prime plus delta. So think of delta as a very, very small quantity. In fact, I invite you to think about it as zero because in terms of uh, sharpening your intuition, that's the right way to think about it. I want it there for some reason later in the talk. So this says that the, oh, and the probability space, the probability space is over the coins of the algorithm. So it's something that we, the good guys, control. It is not the probability space uh, in, of how the data set was formed in the first place. It's over the coins of the algorithm, okay? Now, what this says is, if a bad event is unlikely when I'm not in the data set, then it is still very unlikely when I am. And notice that the quantification just says for all pairs of data sets, D and D prime. So if a bad event is very unlikely when I am in the data set, it's also unlikely when I'm not and also for good events, in fact, for any events. Now, it's impossible to know the actual probabilities of bad events. People who work with data sets and who are forced to think about privacy will often say, well, we do such and such, and you know, the chance that anything bad is going to happen is really very small. They do not know what they're talking about. They do not have a probability space. They don't know what the attacker may or may not have access to or what the innocent data analyst might actually have in mind. They just don't know. Differential privacy does not require you to know. It says that you can still control the change in risk that is incurred by somebody joining or leaving the data set. And we call the quantity epsilon the privacy loss. Epsilon delta differential privacy says, roughly speaking, that with probability at least one minus delta, and remember I said delta is very small, the privacy loss is bounded by epsilon. So epsilon is our notion of privacy loss. There are a few key properties of differential privacy. The first, is that it is immune to auxiliary information. I'm not going to go into it, but you've probably all heard about the compromising of the Netflix data set. That was a use of auxiliary information, in that case, the IMDB. So what it says is that an algorithm is differentially private no matter what the data analyst or the adversary happens to know or have access to. Not only now, but also in the future. Differential privacy is strictly a property of the algorithm itself. Doesn't care what anybody else happens to know. It also means that if some data, or not data, excuse me, if some quantity is released, uh, publicized in a differentially private fashion, then no matter how much somebody takes that information and goes off and thinks about it and computes and so on and so forth, 
the thing still stays differentially private. So we say that differentially private is closed under post-processing. It also is, gives us a concrete measure of privacy loss. That was epsilon. This is more nuanced and more powerful than a single bit of is it private or is it not private. So for example, it allows us to bound cumulative privacy loss over multiple analyses. And in fact, a very simple argument shows that roughly speaking, the epsilon, actually not roughly speaking, exactly, the epsilons and the deltas add up in the worst case. One can actually do better, but in the worst case, the epsilons and deltas add up. Uh, it also says uh, differential privacy also uh, automatically guarantees group privacy. If your K, uh, if, sorry, if your epsilon differentially private for a single individual, then you will be K epsilon differentially private for a group of size K. Most exciting, these properties make differentially pri uh, differential privacy programmable which means that we can build up complicated privacy preserving analyses from simple private building blocks. And this is the essence of computer science, that you can have a set of tools now that you can program with. So let me give you an example of how to achieve differential privacy. This is an example. It is not, um, it is not the only method, it's a primitive, one of those simple differentially private building blocks that I mentioned. So this is the technique of symmetric noise addition. Suppose I have a database D and I want to compute some real valued function F of D. So here's my database, which is blue points on the real line, and F of D is indicated by the red star. Now, suppose when I add a new point, and I recompute, I end up shifting the value of the function f, which makes sense. You know, f may not be a constant function. It will change when you add points. So here we've shifted from f of d to f of d prime when we added this, this point. Intuitively, what we're going to do is we're going to add random noise to obscure the difference f of d versus f of d prime. So when the database is D, this might be the probability distribution on the outcomes. When the database is D prime, this is going to be the probability distribution on the outcomes. This is just for one query. And if we let what's called the sensitivity of the function F be the worst case, the maximum that any single individual could ever under any circumstances, circumstances meaning whatever else is in the database, change the value of the function. So how much can one person's value ever drag the value of the function? That's the sensitivity delta F. So informally, we could say that to achieve epsilon zero, that's delta equals zero case, differential privacy, it suffices to add symmetric noise that is scaled to the sensitivity divided by epsilon. So before I tell you what scaled to means exactly, let's look at delta F over epsilon. Remember, epsilon is our privacy parameter, and small epsilon is better privacy. So if we want really good privacy, we're going to have to add noise that gets bigger. Epsilon is in the denominator. Sensitivity is the amount of change that you might have to cover between adjacent databases in the worst case. So if the sensitivity of your function is large, then you have to add more noise. So delta F, the sensitivity, is in the numerator. So this is the right shape of the parameters. Notice also that the noise depends only on the function and on epsilon, not on the database, and not on the size of the database. So for a lot of applications, you can see that as your database gets larger, you get very, very good accuracy. The noise that you're adding is constant, and the thing that you're computing may not be, may be growing. And this is one of the meanings of privacy in the land of plenty. So differential privacy was a definition that was conceived with internet scale data sets in mind. Okay. So here's an example. Um, 
This is the Laplace distribution. It has a parameter, and the standard deviation is square root of two times the parameter. So when we use the Laplace distribution for our noise distribution, uh, with parameter sensitivity divided by epsilon, as I was just discussing, we get epsilon zero differential privacy. Now, things aren't really very different for vector-valued functions. And in this case, now we have a vector instead of a real-valued function, so our notion of sensitivity could be, let's say, the one norm of f of d minus f of d prime. And so if we add noise that's scaled to that sensitivity over epsilon independently drawn for each of the coordinates in the function, then that will be epsilon zero differentially private. And for vector-valued functions, you could also use the Gaussian. You could also do that for real value, but never mind. And I mention this because sometimes the, and, but now, now, first of all, you see the role of delta. It's multiplying the standard deviation by, uh, we get the square root log one over delta. But we get to use the two norm instead of the one norm. And the two norm is often quite a bit smaller than the one norm. We, so we do this for each coordinate. And we can use this if we, this same idea for handling multiple queries. Okay. So if we ask many queries, we're going to have to have noise that scales up somehow with the sensitivity of the overall query sequence. Okay. There is a rich algorithmic literature on differentially private algorithms. So the algorithms come equipped with proofs of their utility. So that's not just here's a private algorithm, but people expend quite a bit of creativity in trying to get the maximum utility um, uh, uh, bang for a given privacy buck. And um, there's also a book that is for sale in the room over there uh, that Aaron Roth and I wrote on the algorithmic foundations of differential privacy. So let me give you an example of a differentially private analysis that's, well, powerful, and yet you have all of the tools already at your disposal. So uh, eigenspace computation. We're given a matrix, a data matrix, in which each row is the data of one uh, person. So we have m people in this database, and uh, let's say that the number of attributes is n. And our goal is to find a k-dimensional projection matrix that maximizes the, uh, the variance or the captured energy of our data matrix. Now, there are a lot of reasons for doing this. You guys know all about them. Um, noise reduction, when you have data that are essentially low dimensional but with a little bit of noise, finding correlations, improving efficiency of algorithms when the efficiency, de the, the, the costs depend on the dimensionality and so on. Um, and you also know that the projection matrix that we want is uh, maximized, is the one that is the span of the top k eigenvectors of A transpose A. And I'll call that matrix C. Now, I have yet another reason besides the standard ones for wanting to do this computation. Remember that we were in our simple noise addition for vector valued cases, we were adding noise to cover every possible new point. So suppose we have low dimensional data, but we don't know the, the, the span of our data set. So we've got low dimensional data and we're looking to compute some function that always lies in the span of the data. Because we don't know this, we don't know what the, the span is, we have to account for all possible other data points, which could be in lots and lots of different directions that, have not, that are completely orthogonal to the actual span of our data. So we're going to be paying a price in accuracy that ends up uh, depending in a bad way on the ambient dimension rather than on the true dimensionality of the data. So the error due to privacy will increase with the ambient dimension. And if we could just reduce the dimensionality, we would improve our accuracy. You might think that you should just run 
you know, principal components analysis, find the subspace and, 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 and project your data and go from there. But we can't sort of do this in an overt fashion. That is to say, the subspace itself is disclosive. It will tell you, it will leak information about your data elements. So we have to do this in a privacy preserving way. And our approach will be the following. We will, in a privacy preserving way, find a low dimensional subspace capturing most of the variants of our data. Optionally, we can publish this projector, but we do not release the projected data. They stay hidden. Then we take a differentially private algorithm and run it on now this still hidden uh, uh, projected data. How interesting. Something odd just happened here. I don't know if you saw it. Okay. So, our main observation, we want the top K eigenvectors of A transpose A. The strategy is going to be that we will publish a noisy version of this matrix, and we will allow the data analyst to then do uh, the eigenvector decomposition and find that, uh, uh, those top K eigenvectors of the perturbed matrix. Now, A transpose A, is a sum of outer products, one donated by each element in the data set A. So suppose A and A prime are adjacent in the sense that A has the data of just one more person, Xi, and um, uh, okay, A has the data of just one more person. In that case, C minus C prime, where C prime is A prime transpose A prime, C minus C prime is just Xi, Xi transpose, just that one outer product. Now, we make the assumption or we enforce by normalizing that the data rows have norm at most one, Euclidean norm at most one. So in this case, C minus C transpose has Frobenius norm at most one. Suppose we look at C as an n times m dimensional, sorry, 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 n times n, an n squared dimensional object. Think of it as a vector where we've just taken the rows and we've concatenated them, okay? So this is a high dimensional vector now whose two norm is bounded by one. So we want to release f of a, which is a transpose a, and we're viewing this as a high dimensional vector. You've already seen how to deal with a high dimensional vector. You add noise to each coordinate that is drawn from a Gaussian that has this standard deviation. Okay. And we know from our little discussion that f of a, which is c, minus f of a prime, which is c prime, has two norm at most one. So that stuff that I've circled is just one. So basically, we're adding constant noise that depends on epsilon and delta in each dimension. So roughly speaking, the algorithm is publish the noisy vector C plus E, where E has, its, has these Gaussian coordinates. And variants of this algorithm have appeared in the literature. What we're mostly contributing is the analysis. So here's the exact algorithm. The only thing that I've tweaked here is that I'm forcing the noise metric, the noise matrix to be symmetric, and that's for the purposes of the analysis. So we'll, we'll, we'll draw, say, the upper triangle, and then we'll fill in the lower one symmetrically. And then if you want to rank, so we publish this noisy uh, version of A transpose A, and if you need a rank K projector, you output the top K subspace of the noisy version. So I'll say just a couple words about the utility analysis, not much. Um, suppose pi k is the top k subspace projection of the real data matrix C, I mean A transpose A. And uh, pi k tilde is the top k subspace of the noisy version. Then a very simple analysis, which is actually written out in full here, and which relies on just some basic facts about, about uh, from, from linear algebra, says that this first term, pi k tilde, the energy captured by our algorithm, 
read the parts in red, is at least the best energy capture, the optimum energy capture, minus this trace of the difference between the projection matrix times the error matrix. So we use random matrix theory to tell us that the error matrix, because of the way we drew those Gaussians, uh, uh, has a two norm that's very likely to be about square root of n. We combine this with von Neumann's trace inequality to get a bound on the last error term there of at most 2k times the two norm of the uh, error matrix. So our algorithm is within k root n of optimal. Now, optimal, opt, actually grows as we increase the number of data points. So we are again in this privacy in the land of plenty where in some relative sense our estimate is better and better and better as we add more and more data points because the error, which depends on k and the dimension, is not increasing as we increase the number of data points. And we also show that this bound is tight. Having shown that it is tight, we also show that you can um, do better than the lower bound um, by a more refined analysis that exploits an eigengap if there is a gap in the eigenvalues. So it turns out that if the gap in the eigenvalues, which is often the reason, by the way, for doing a principal components analysis, but if this gap in the eigenvalues is large, like bigger than order of root n, uh, then we do beat the lower bound. Okay, so in the last, more time than I thought, in the last few minutes, uh, I want to talk about a surprising application of differential privacy, which we can call correctness protection. So, there's been a lot of talk about false discoveries in science, and there have been many efforts to control false discovery from Benjamini and Hochberg's fabulous BHQ algorithm and the sequelae for controlling the false discovery rate in multiple hypothesis testing, to sophisticated cross-validation techniques and the use of holdout sets. But there is a fundamental disconnect between the theory and the practice. The theory is for the static case. You have all your hypotheses, you know what they are, you do your tests and then you, you try to analyze the set of p-values that you get. And science is by nature an adaptive process. If you think about how you yourself work with data, you probably look at it, do some computations, look at it some more, do some more computations and so on. Uh, not only are your algorithms inherently adaptive, but the science themselves itself is. So for example, somebody does a study, that study suggests further questions. The next study is based on the results of the first study. Now, the effects might be mitigated if you're always drawing fresh data, but things are going to get worse. We're going to have these large corpuses of data that are going to be shared and reused and reused, and it's completely out of the question to go out and find another data set. Again, the land of plenty. Now your data set is so big, no one's going to be finding a new one. So things are just going to get worse in, ter uh, in terms of the risks imposed by adaptivity. Um, there is a little bit about this in the literature. You might have heard of Friedman's paradox in which you have an equation which you fit and variables that have small t statistics are dropped giving a new equation and you fit it again and Friedman shows that even when there is no relationship at all between x and y, the procedure overfits and finds significant relationships. In our study, uh, we can think again of our data analyst or now a collection of data analysts who are interacting with the data set. You can think of these questions that are being asked of the data set as simple questions or you can think about them as studies that are being run. Conceptually, it's the same thing. They could be complicated computations, they could be simple computations. So the ith question will depend on the answers to the first, second, third, and so on questions. 
And the worry is that somehow the analyst finds a query, a study, for which the database is no longer representative of the population, and then so reports some you know, amazing, surprising discovery. And what we show in joint work with Feldman Hart, Patassi, and Reingold and Roth is that differential privacy neutralizes the risks incurred by adaptivity. And the key property is that it is hard to find a query for which the data set is not representative. So let me just give you a little bit of intuition about that. Let's fix a question, say, what fraction of the population is over six feet tall? Now, if we draw a data set at random, almost all large data sets will give an approximately correct reply to this question, the fractional question. So in our language, most data sets are representative of the underlying population with respect to this query. Now, if in the process of adaptive exploration, the analyst actually finds a query for which the data set is not representative, then in some intuitive sense, she learned something significant about the data set. So this gives us the intuition that preserving the privacy of the data may in fact prevent overfitting. And this is what we show to be the case. So while there are known contributions between notions of the stability of a learning algorithm and its ability to generalize, these notions do not compose. And differential privacy is stronger and does compose. So it gives us a calculus and a whole bunch of algorithmic work um, uh, for building up complex algorithms that satisfy stability guarantees sufficiently well to give generalization. I'm a little out of time. So I can hear your objections. We want to do things the way we always have. We don't want to have differential privacy interference. Let us get at the raw data the way we always do. And I say, go ahead, make my day. So I'm going to introduce the reusable holdout. We're going to take the data. We're going to partition it randomly, as usual, between into a training set and a holdout, and do whatever you want with the training set. But when you want to check its validity on the holdout, use a differentially private mechanism to access the holdout. So this is basically just an algorithm, a complicated algorithm that has the training data in hardwired into its code that's now interacting with the holdout set. So whatever we proved about differential privacy preventing overfitting is going to apply to the holdout set. So just in a little more detail, in a traditional holdout, you learn on a training set, you check the validity against the hold, holdout set, which has essentially, since you haven't touched them yet, fresh samples for you. Your intuition is that the holdout is drawn from the same distribution as T, so any overfitting you might have done on the training set will be detected when you check with the holdout set. And then what? What do you do? I don't know. H is no longer fresh. I'm not sure it makes sense to go back and train some more and then go back to the holdout set in the traditional sense. And in fact, this can lead, lead to overfitting on the holdout set, and this is uh, illustrated in the Kaggle uh, data analysis competitions. So in the reusable holdout set, we learn on the training set, but now we check against the holdout via a differentially private mechanism. This will give us useful information about the distribution from which H holdout and training were drawn, and future exploration does not significantly depend on the holdout. In other words, the holdout set effectively remains fresh. So we took the stability properties of differential privacy and we used them not for achieving privacy, but in the service of other goals, correctness protection. Um, and since uh, Michael Kearns will be giving the Posner lecture in a few minutes, um, for statistical queries, aka learning means of random variables, uh, at least one of our techniques allows us to efficiently handle an incredibly large number of queries, tolerating up to the size of the holdout set squared number of failed validations. Thank you very much.
Yes. Hi. Is this on? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So how do you ensure proper correlation of added noise? If somebody asks a question, you know, what is the average of x, and a separate question, what is the average of 2x, you have to add the same correlated noise or they will learn something more, right? You need to go back to what I said about asking multiple questions. So what I said is that the scale of the noise depends on the sensitivity of the entire query sequence. And that addresses your question. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I should mention that for many classes of queries, there's very serious algorithmic work to, to ensure better accuracy than would be done naively using this uh, independent noise to each answer approach. So sometimes it is indeed possible to do better than this naive version. So you mentioned the, that these techniques are particularly uh, uh, developed specifically for internet scale data sets. Uh, yeah. So I was curious, uh, why are we concerned about overfitting for internet scale data? Overfitting in an adaptive sense can happen very easily independent of the scale of the data. And uh, I invite you to read a forthcoming paper that gives some examples. Yes. Yeah, one question about the low dimensional analysis where you're adding noise there. So there's a, another constraint, right, is that the covariance matrix has to be positive definite. So when you add noise, but then you, the analyst could project onto the semi-positive definite set and maybe remove some of the noise you added. So do you take that into account? Remember I said that you don't release the projected data. Yeah. Uh, you can release the projector, but not the projected data. So if you're looking for the subspace, you, you release the subspace projector. If you want to r run another differentially private algorithm on the projected data, you do not expose the projected data. You do that under the covers. Uh -huh. so but, but what happens if you add noise and get a negative eigenvalue? Do you, uh, because there is a chance of ha having that happen. Uh. Moritz, do you have a comment? What? There's a chance? But that doesn't matter for the analysis. So the noise step matrix is not positive semi-definite anymore, but it doesn't matter for the analysis. Just take the top K, the top low rank approximation. Yeah, I mean, this would help. If you have a lot of data, I agree that it's not, this probably this happening won't. It won't be in the top K, but there is a pro there's a small chance it could actually be in the top, there'll be a negative eigenvalue. Right. So in, the in other words, if, if the noise is so large that it affects the top K eigenvalues, then you don't want to run this method. So you're always in the setting where, you know, you want the noise to be smaller than the Kth eigenvalue or singular value, and in that case, it stays positive seven. He knows more linear algebra than I do. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. I, so uh, thank you for the, uh, the very nice talk. I was wondering whether um, if you learn a distribution which captures the data, uh, then is there a hope uh, that you can just perturb the, um, the output of querying the distribution in a systematic way? I mean, wh what, you, what you showed about typically uh, finding the, the top rank uh, vectors is analyzing how to perturb in, uh, for a given query. I was wondering whether there is a general hope, I mean, of generalizing how to perturb the answer of the distribution in order to get the result. So if I understand your question correctly, there are algorithms that do essentially learn the distribution of the data, like the private multiplicative weights algorithm of Hart and Rothblum. And uh, once you've done that, you can now so I think that that's the answer to your question. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Other questions? Okay. Yes. Uh, 
So I have two questions. Uh, first is I, I, I got lost because uh, for the first question, you said that if you have multiple queries against the database, uh, you have to know about them first. No, I didn't say you have to know about them first. Okay. For example, I'll give you a method. I, have a, I want that my cumulative privacy loss is going to be epsilon. This is not a great method, but it's just an, to illustrate the point. I want that my cumulative loss is going to be epsilon. I'll blow half of my budget on the first question. I'll blow half of the remaining budget on the second question, and so on. After a while, I'm answering with essentially pure noise, but then again, we know that after a while, we have to stop answering accurately because we have that fundamental law of information recovery that had nothing to do with differential privacy. So, so you don't necessarily need to know in advance. Okay, so, so you have a certain privacy budget. And how does this compare to, say, the Bonferroni scheme when you just try to get more and more significant answers uh, as long as you have more and more Wonderful queries? question. And it is exactly that question that, that led to this investigation that uh, taught us something about stability under you know, correctness protection, that differential privacy gives correctness protection. I started with the question, of whether the more, the, the, there are some more sophisticated composition results that have better bounds than the epsilons and deltas add up version. And I started with the question of whether that can teach us anything about improving over what's being done with the non-adaptive multiple hypothesis testing case. I do not yet know the answer. It's a great question. Thank you. Thanks.